Hello, and welcome to my talk, There's a Snake in the Birdhouse, Building a Python Culture at Verbo. My name is Mason Egger, and I am currently a developer advocate at DigitalOcean. However, before I was a developer advocate at DigitalOcean, I was a site reliability engineer at Verbo, which, for those of you that are local Austinites, may originally remember the name being HomeAway, uh, actually not too far from the library where we would have held the PyTexas uh, conference this year. So it is a local Austin company. Um, and whenever I first started at Verbo, uh, there was no Python there. There was no Python officially supported by the company. And today, I'm going to tell you the story of how I led the effort to build a Python culture at Verbo. Um, this talk is going to be very anecdotal. It's going to be a lot of my experiences and what I uh, dealt with whenever I was trying to bring Python to Verbo. Um, and you may be asking, well, who is this talk for? This talk is for anyone who wants to use Python at their job but is currently unable uh, wants to build a stronger Python community at their job, wants to learn how to introduce Python and evangelize any technology, not just Python. Uh, the tips and tricks that I'm going to go over with you today could be used to bring any uh, tech stack into your company, not just Python. And hopefully you'll learn from some of my successes, learn from my mistakes, and be able to bring Python to your job or any tech that you desire. So, before we go into what I did, we kind of need to explain how the company was whenever I got there. So um, engineers at Verbo deploy all of their applications to an internal PaaS. So essentially you would build a, uh, a Docker container image of your API or whatever you're using, and you would deploy it to this internal PaaS that was, at, uh, that was managed by my team. So essentially there were project templates for supported languages uh, within the company. So the company was primarily a Java shop with Node coming in and starting to do more and more with it. Um, but you basically could go in and you would say, hey, I want a Java project. And it would give you an entire project archetype of test suites, uh, a basic Hello World app, all of the configurations you needed to run inside of the PaaS. Now, if Java or Node just wasn't the tool for you and you needed to use something else, there was this concept of off-road. So you could deploy your applications off-road, but there was no official support from the platform teams, which essentially meant that if you had a problem with it, um, if the platform teams were nice to you and had time, they would be able to maybe debug it. But at the end, there was no team supporting this like there was with the Java and with the Node projects. So if you ran into issues, it was kind of like up to you to solve the problem. Nobody was going to be able uh, to help you. So with this being said, I was asked to lead the task to bring Python in as the third language uh, that would be supported uh, throughout the company. So the first thing that we did is we had a discovery meeting. And this is really vital, I would say, uh, for anyone who wants to bring a new language or a new framework into their uh, company, figure out what people actually want. So I met with the various teams that were interested in Python. These were the data science teams, the machine learning teams, a couple of the API uh, team members uh, arrived to show and figure out what their interests were. So we basically presented uh, that we wanted to bring Python on road and we asked the teams what they wanted. And this comes up to my first don't. And my first don't is don't build something that no one actually wants. If I had not done this discovery meeting, if I had not figured out what people actually want, then I could have built an entire project and then at the very end said, hey, here's Python and nobody would have liked it. Nobody would have needed it. Um, we actually had to make sure that we people actually wanted to use Python within the company. The fact that people were showing up the, to this discovery meeting was a good um, indicator that people were interested, but it doesn't necessarily mean that people wanted it. But after this meeting, we did find out that people were interested and we took in their requirements. Like, you know, we they wanted to use a certain web framework. They wanted it to come with a certain amount of testing by default, what kind of docs engine we were gonna use, what kind of package management tool they were gonna be forced to learn. Um, all of these things were discussed in this meeting so that I could build the thing that people actually wanted instead of the thing that in my mind, I think I know what a Python developer wants but actually asking them works a whole lot better. Um, which leads to another don't, which is don't develop in isolation or avoid others' opinions. So whenever I was building all of this and whenever we were doing this, I was constantly checking back in with these teams to make sure that they were on board with it. You know, if, if I ran into an issue or I ran into a problem where uh, I didn't know which tool to pick or which direction to go, I actually had a Slack channel that I would jump into and I'd be like, hey, this is the situation that I'm experiencing. This is what I'm thinking. What are your opinions? And gauge the interest in that. Because if you build in isolation, 
Um, again, you're going to reach the same, almost the same point where if you build something that no one wants, you're going to build something that people didn't really have a say in. And if they don't feel like they had a say in it, they may not want to use it because they didn't really feel like their, their tools were being represented or what they wanted to do was being dealt with. Um, so definitely never develop in isolation, always elicit feedback from people whenever you're trying to build something like this. So the result of this discovery meeting turned out that I was tasked with building a cookie cutter that creates a default Flask application for the platform, including static analysis, unit tests, product documentation, logging, metrics, uh, service discovery, secrets discovery. All of this stuff was going to be baked into the application by default. And then basically you would clone, you would run this archetype, basically run the cookie cutter app and you would get a ready to go thing and you would remove the hello world text from the Flask application and you would be ready to go. So this is what I was tasked with building. So when it comes to building the archetype, in my experience, um, create a meaningful set of expectations and use cases. Um, so what we did is we, we talked with the two teams, like which, what do people actually need? And there was actually two different groups. There were people that just wanted standard Python, like your typical Flask. So that way you could build an API or something like that. Very straightforward, you know, the, the standard Flask application uh, archetype. And then there were the people that wanted to use this for data science and machine learning and actually deploy their data science models to our, you know, distributed paths. And that being the case, you know, we had to make, actually make the decision. Like, do we try to make all of these go together? Do we try to make them go differently? Um, and in the end, we ended up building out two. We ended up building up a base Python one and then one with Miniconda. And we set the expectations for both. You know, the mini, the base Python Flask one was for API generally and would be good for that. And the Miniconda one was going to have a lot more of the data science packages. Might not be best for API development, but definitely good for machine learning development and stuff like that. And that brings to another do, uh, provide an out of box experience with sensible defaults. So when by this, um, the archetype essentially provided everything you needed. It provided an example using unit tests or sorry, a uh, pi test to, uh, show you how to run your test. And it had default tests running out of the gate. Uh, it provided documentation. Everything was already set up with Sphinx and swagger. So that way you could just deploy your app and you would do document in code and you would get your documentation done. It gave examples of how to do that. More often than not, if you provide people with documentation and tests inside of the archetype, because they're already there, people are actually more willing to test them because you've done all the heavy lifting and you've figured out how to do all of it. People will write the docs. People will write the tests. One of the things that I have noticed is people don't necessarily like having to choose all of these frameworks, figure out how to set them up, how to run all of this, what to do with the results afterwards. So by providing an out of box experience where tests were already set up, where static analysis was already set up, where documentation was being generated at every build and where you could get comprehensive reports of your test framework out of, uh, out of it. And you could immediately import those into Jenkins where you could see them. People actually were writing tests, uh, you know, day one, because it was all set up for them. So by providing this experience for them, people actually really want to use this stuff. So if you're gonna go big, you know, do it all, add everything, do the docs, do the static analysis, do the unit tests, don't just provide the code. Um, otherwise it's unlikely that people will add it in later. Um, another good thing that you can definitely do is create a uh, good documentation and a rationale of your decisions. So the documentation that I created for this project is very, very robust um, and actually inspired some other robust documentation within the company. And essentially I documented everything I could think of. I documented the, a quick start guide on how to use the archetype, what its use cases were, uh, what its use cases weren't. Um, and then all of the known bugs and issues, there were bugs and issues. And sometimes I was the sole maintainer of this for a while. I didn't have the time to actually fix these issues. So I would like, if I knew it was really, uh, like really important that the users knew about it, but I didn't have time to fix it. I would go and document it. Or if it was a minor bug that I could get to next sprint again, I would put the documentation, the bug in the documentation and people could go and see it. And then as I, uh, fix them, I would actually remove them and say, Hey, this was resolved and do all of that on the documentation. Um, make sure you provide a rationale of why you're choosing the certain technology. So why did I choose Flask? Why did I choose PyTest? Why at that time we used PipEnv for our package manager? Why did I choose that? Well, every single option, every single choice that I made, I actually, in the documentation, there was a link 
uh, on the side that said rationale of decisions. And it compared all the other ones, Flask to Django, uh, Pip versus Pippin versus Poetry versus Con Conda, all of those things. And in there, I stated exactly why I chose to use what I did and then rationale for why the other decisions didn't fit my needs or maybe they did. And I was like, well, you know, I chose this one, but this one would work equally as well. We'd have to make these changes that the reason that I did this is because if someone were to come in and they were to see this archetype and they see that it's using Python, but it's not using their favorite tool, they may go, oh, well, this is great, but it's not using my favorite tool. Why are they not using my favorite tool? And instead of messaging me on Slack, they can just read the documentation and they can see this is why I chose to do this. Um, another good thing that this proves against is, as you could tell by my title slide, I'm no longer there. <laughs> I don't work for Verbo anymore. I actually wrote this talk before I left, and I'm still giving this talk. Um, and if anybody in the company now wants to, they go back and they're still using this, like, well, why did Mason choose this? Well, they can't just ask me anymore. I'm not working there, but they can always go back and check my documentation. And this really helps because, you know, not everybody's going to stay at a company forever. People are going to move on. And because people are going to move on, this helps solve the problems. Like, why did they do this? Well, I wrote it down right there. Go read it and you figure it out. Um, another thing that I also documented that I feel is really valuable is the development journey. Like, where did I, where did I stumble? Where did I have issues? Where, where did I see bugs and had to fix them? How did I fix them? Um, when I had meetings, what came out of those meetings? I documented all of that inside of this documentation because again, I don't work there. Nobody remember, probably, there's probably not that many people that still work there that remember this entire process. Um, and it helps other people like, which we'll get to later. Other people may want to actually, uh, try to create another archetype. Maybe they want to support Golang or Rust or something. And by knowing what all of the steps were in my journey, they can now read this documentation and figure it out from there. So a, a big don't for this is don't tr try uh, to solve every Python use case with one tool. And a big one for this example that I can think of is the package manager. So whenever we were setting up between using pip and or we use pip in or mini conda, we went back and forth on, you know, what do we need to actually separate these into two different container types? Like, can we just use one and can we make the data science people use pip in or can we make the... Um, can we make the regular API people use Conda? And in reality, we could have made those decisions, but we ended up going with, it's not the best tool for the use cases. Um, Conda is, is, is a great package manager and works great for data science and ML tools. Um, but the mini Conda uh, installer, I think at the time was a little bit bigger and took up a little bit more space in the Docker when you're trying to deploy microservices. Um, it doesn't really work all that great. So, we didn't, we didn't want to use it for that. We didn't want to uh, go with something that, you know, our Python population didn't want. They were used to something like pipenv and the vice versa. We didn't want to force the Miniconda people to use pipenv because it doesn't get the uh, proper data science packages for them. Like it doesn't get the proper uh, like machine compiled binaries that come with the Miniconda, the optimized binaries and optimized packages for these data science tools. A lot of them only exist in the Conda repository. So we had to make a choice and by not forcing Python to solve every one of problems and not solve, not forcing us to use one tool and this tool is going to solve everything. We actually came to a more robust system that benefited everybody than forcing everybody to just use one thing. And that, that normally that rarely ever works and it usually leads to eventually somewhere down the line, someone's going to fork the project and build it out the way that they want. So one of the do's that we have here is uh, use as few internal or proprietary tools as possible. Um, this makes open sourcing your project a lot easier. So if you work for a large company, Verbo was part of Expedia Group, so it was a relatively large company and there was a lot of internal pipelining tools that were already built at Verbo before I got there that a lot of these projects used but they were very Verbo specific. They did not, um, they were not open sourceable. They were just very much Verbo was baked in there. And because we, we didn't know if we ever wanted to uh, open source this archetype, but we did know that it's possible that someone would want to open source maybe the one of the Flask apps they write or something. And if we wound up using too much proprietary tooling, we would be unable to open source this project or we'd have to do an amazing amount of work to do it. So taking that in mind, I used almost no Verbo internal stuff. And I luckily I worked, my, my desk was like right next to the team who, the, uh, the, build, the build pipeline team that did a lot of this internal tooling. And I was consulting with them every step of the way. How, how would you do this? How could we go about this where 
where we could easily remove the verboness, the little bit that was in there out, and this be ready for open source, but also comply with your pipeline standards. And it was a really fun uh, process for both of us. We all, we all learned a little bit from it and it turned out really good. And at the end there, you could open source one of those flask apps with, I think you have to remove two files and it, you just change your make file. We actually already have the, uh, the open source commands in there. And it's like there, the make target is actually open source dash build run install and stuff. So that way you could just remove them and open source it immediately. Always design with open source in mind. Um, if you design your software with the open source mindset that you're going to eventually open source it to the world, then you get a lot less of this, uh, proprietary fluff in your code. So while I was doing all of this, there was another process that I was also a part of that kind of made this really interesting when it comes to like, how was I actually going to prepare this and how was I going to do this? And that was the internal paths was going through a 2.0 revision. We were actually building a brand new PaaS using a brand new scheduler moving off of Mesos to HashiCorp's Nomad um, and changing a lot of how the, the PaaS worked. So because of this, uh, it was being built at the same time that we were building the Python support. So I kind of took this as an opportunity to say, well, we're going to want people to move over to the new PaaS. I was on the PaaS team. So we, we knew that we wanted to make people move. Let's entice them a little bit by saying that the Python architecture would only support version two. Now, in reality, if you were an expert at our paths, which there were some employees in the company, um, you could realize all you had to do was add one file and it would become compatible with, with the version one. But we didn't say that out loud. Um, so we're like, it only supports version two. If you want Python, you need to come join us over here in the new space. Um, and this actually worked kind of well. Um, it was really good because I was allowed to take advantage, some of the advantage of the new features. So not only were, was Python going to be on the new paths, but I could use Python to, I could use Python in this archetype to demonstrate all of the new features. So people were in the company, were getting a view of like, oh, these are the new features that are coming in multipass too, because I can see what's happening in the Python space. Um, and people really, really did enjoy that. The bad part of this was I became very dependent on the PaaS development timeline. So this project took about four months longer than I was expecting it to because I would get going and I would write some of this code and I would go to test on the PaaS and I would expose a bug on the PaaS. And maybe that was not the thing that they were expecting and they didn't have the time to fix it right away. So I would raise this bug, we would discuss it, they would put it in their backlog um, and then they would work on it and, and then we would come back to it. and. Uh, this, this, this took time and this, this happened multiple times. So I became very dependent on this timeline. Um, it was good for them because I was their first tester. I found most of the bugs in the system because I was constantly the one beating it up and actually trying to use it. But at the same time, it constantly slowed down the project. And then a project that should have taken me two to three months ended up taking me almost more than half a year to uh, actually accomplish. Uh, but it was, it was interesting. It was, it was an interesting experience for me. I kind of chalked this up to both being a success and a failure. It's a success because, you know, we got it on the new paths and it worked and it was a failure because it really delayed the timeline. Um, this one's just kind of weird and you kind of have to take it as you see it. Maybe if your uh, company is rolling out like Kubernetes versus something else, maybe don't tie it directly to that uh, Kubernetes rollout. I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully the story will resonate with some of you and it'll be useful. Um, it was a weird, it was a weird thing. I enjoyed it but it was weird. So testing of this new product of this new paths, um, find yourself a group of empowered beta testers, people who are actually like really excited about Python. They're going to help you evangelize this later. And that's exactly what happened is we found a group of people that wanted to use it and they were our biggest cheerleaders for all of this. Find first customers who will actually attempt to use this application and product. So there's a big difference between beta testers and people who are like, I'm willing to get paged because we think you did the right thing. There's a big difference. So find the first customer, quote unquote, um, who's going to be using this in production. It may be yourself if you're the one building this out, but just be willing to use it in production because if you can't find someone who's willing to use it in production, no one's going to. Like somebody has to take that first step and be willing to take the risk. And if no one does it, then that doesn't really put a lot of confidence in your project. And then people probably won't want to use it. Um, one of the big don'ts is don't be come upset by negative feedback or bug reports. There's going to be negative feedback and there's going to be bug reports. 
Um, as long as there is software, there will be bugs. So you're just, it's something you have to get used to. Take him, take him in, take the considerations in. Um, if it's an actual bug, fix it. That's, that's our job. If it's, you know, negative feedback or people that are like, you know, I don't like this. I don't like because of X, Y, Z, try to meet them halfway, try to figure out why explain to them, but also know that, um, you can't make everyone happy. And as long as it's not, you know, terrible, you might just have to take the feedback. So a couple of do's around evangelism, just, this is for Python, but for anything, how to evangelize a product within your company. Um, demonstrate the flexibility of Python. It, it can do a lot of things. You know, one of the reasons we love it is how it can, it can be a web language. It can be machine learning. It can be whatever it wants to be. Demonstrate how you can use Python for almost anything. Um, if you have troubling applications, you try rewriting them in Python, rewrite them, uh, the existing applications that are complex or troublesome in Python and see if people, uh, see if people notice, see if, um, See if you get a performance increase or a decrease. If you get a decrease, obviously take care of that, but just check and see, see what you can do to make it better. Um, if you can fix those, that's a great way to get Python in the door is like, Hey, it fixed, you know, this service was bad. Now I wrote it in Python. Now it crashes 90% less than the old one. Not bad. Um, ask to write new applications or features in Python. So if there's a new feature that's coming up and it's relatively independent of other things, say, Hey, Maybe I could write this in Python. Let's give it a shot. Let's see what Python looks like in our ecosystem and see if it's something that we want to pursue. Uh, and the last one is more of a sneaky one. And I would say <laughs> it is kind of sneaky. Be the temporary solution. So as my ex boss used to say, um, there is no discernible difference between a proof of concept and production software. Um, and some of you may be shaking your heads going, yeah, it's, it's pretty true. There are a lot of times that you're like, how did that code get in prod and it's there and it's running. Um, so if it's like a really quick fix or something's going on or like, oh, well, we'll like, you know, the, the world's on fire. I need to write this, uh, microservice right now. Yes. I want to write it in go, but it's going to take me so long. I can write it in 10 lines of Python code. Let me just deploy it and we'll, we'll get it out there and then we'll rewrite it and go or whatever language you want. And we'll, we'll deal with that later, but let's just, let's solve the problem now. And then let's, you know, rewrite it later. You'd be surprised how often some of that code is still in production. Um, so yeah, definitely take a look into that. Um, it is a sneakier solution and I don't always recommend it, but sometimes it works. Um, some evangelism don'ts. I would say, don't say that language sucks. You should use Python, remove Python and put any other language and then have this comment directed at you and, and ask yourself how you feel about it. Do you like it when people say Python sucks? You should use Golang or PHP or something like that. No, we, nobody likes it. Everybody likes our languages for a reason. Like we like the programming languages that we choose. That's why we're here at a Python conference today. So saying this to people is the greatest way to turn people off of a language immediately and to win yourself zero friends. So don't do it. Um, don't try to use Python to solve problems. Python doesn't handle well. Do not like, if you have a massively like paralyzed multi-processing, uh, you know, data crunch or something, and you need to do that, or you're doing something like heavy on network resources, something that basically requires lots of threads and lots of multi-processing, maybe Python's not the best for that. Um, don't make Python solve problems that Python can't solve. That's a great way to make people not like Python because they're not going to blend. They're not going to go, Oh, well, Python's just not good at doing this. They're going to go, Oh, Python bad. That's immediately the thought they're going to go to. And you, you really don't want this. So don't put Python in a situation that it can't win. You know, it's the same thing as, you know, setting someone up for failure. Same thing. Don't set Python up for failure. Don't be overbearing. If someone isn't interested in using Python, that's okay. Maybe come back and talk to them at a later date. Maybe, you know, just talk to other people, but don't be the person that's constantly like, you want to use Python? You want to use Python? You want to use Python? That's, that's going to drive people up a wall and it's just not going to work out well for you. So don't do it. If someone's not interested, respect that, walk away. Maybe eventually they'll become interested later and, you know, they'll come to you. Okay, so the results from this experiment or this giant project that I was working on were as follows. Um, within the first month of having this available for the public to use, um, 80 applications were deployed using this new Python archetype in production. So I'm going to take that as a win. That was really good. Um, there are a lot of microservices at Verbo. If anyone ever worked there, there's a lot. So um, this was pretty good. Um, unfortunately, I left relatively soon after this. So I don't, I have no idea about what the stats are of it today. Um, but yeah, 
Uh, and other, a really cool thing is right before I was leaving, other people within the company uh, use the development journey part of my documentation to start building support for Golang. And I was getting questions on like, hey, how did you do this? What did you, how did you incorporate these people in? So all of that documentation that I did was actually very valuable because it helped people figure out, you know, hey, I want Golang here. And Mason obviously did this entire journey and he could probably tell me stories about it. Let's go bug him. Um, or at least now that I'm gone, let's read the documentation because I wrote it all down. Always document. If you've ever seen any of my other talks, they're very often about documentation and document, document, document. So uh, that was it. The project was a success. People were using Python internally at Verbo. Um, I left after that to join DigitalOcean and we all lived happily ever after. Uh, so I just want to say thank you very much for tuning in today. If you have any questions, um, feel free to tweet at me at Mason Egger. And if you want to watch me break things in real time, you can come watch me on Twitch because I break a lot of code on a lot of days. So thank you again very much. And I hope you enjoy the rest of PyTexas.